This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief Sierra 117, with a shout out to the Xbox Expansion Pass. Keep your heads up during this time of isolation. Stay positive. Play some games. Most importantly, finish the fight. Thanks for listening to XEP. Master Chief, out. Welcome one, welcome all to episode 76 of the Xbox Expansion Pass, recorded on Sunday, March 28, 2021. I am your host, Luke Lore, the Insipid Ghost. In this episode, we honor the passing of Xbox Live while welcoming the new Xbox Network. We'll discuss the possible acquisition of Discord by Microsoft and chat the Twitch Gaming ID at Xbox Showcase. Enjoy. Yet another week of gaming is upon us and behind us. Welcome to XEP, discussing all things in the Gamerverse, as they pertain to the Xbox ecosystem. And as I am wont to do each and every week, I want to start by offering words of kindness to those who have made my gaming week better. And this week, the words of kindness are perhaps a bit self-serving, as I extend them to Ainsley Bowden and Joseph Morand, Ainsley of Seasoned Gaming, Joseph Morand of the Trophy Room uh, podcast, respectively. Of course, these are names that, if you are familiar with XEP and kind of my surrounding circles, they're not new to you. However, we together, the three of us, have just launched a new podcast called Cast Co-op that is launching every other Friday over on Seasoned Gaming's website. And in this, we'll be chatting games and news and have a humorous approach to a lot of the the different topics that might pertain to the gaming industry overall. But for Ainsley and Joe to be joining me and talking shop and discussing uh, all these things will will give me a bit of a respite from the solo hosting duties, of course, because we each host our own podcast separately. But more than that, I get to kind of express a little bit of personality and be a bit more... Uh, funny because I can be funny if you put the, me around the, in the right people. That's not true. I am not the funny one of the group, but I like to pretend that I am. Bottom line, guys, if you'll check out Cast Co op, episode one is up now. It's on all podcast services and, of course, YouTube over on Season Gaming's website. Uh, sh- kind word to them. Shout out to them. And thank you to so many uh, of you who have already found out about the show and checked it out as well. Let's get to the news. First up on the docket this week, we say goodbye to Xbox Live as Microsoft has officially rebranded Xbox Live to be the Xbox Network. Now this was a surprise move, at least on my end of things. I was shocked to find out that Microsoft was unhappy with the name Xbox Live, despite the fact that the name Xbox Network is easily understood. Microsoft did say that the Xbox Network refers to the underlying Xbox Online service, and the update from Xbox Live to Network is intended to distinguish that underlying service from Xbox Live Gold memberships. Despite the easily understood name Xbox Network, I am a bit puzzled by this, as we hear my dog hopping in the background. Uh, I am a bit puzzled by this, as Xbox Live had a lot of name recognition. Of course, Xbox Live has been around for over 18 years at this point, and to see that name go the way of the Dodo is eyebrow-raising to me, as Microsoft has really struggled with its naming conventions for services, for consoles, and peripherals since the Xbox's inception. For goodness sakes, the Xbox, the Xbox One, the Xbox 360, the Xbox Connect, Connect 2.0, ID at Xbox, those names are difficult for the average, uh, the average consumer or the casual consumer to truly understand just what is, is being discussed in that particular moment. And I don't think Xbox Live necessarily had that problem. That is to say, though, Xbox Network easily understood, and it will not puzzle casual audiences, and I can certainly understand that aspect of it. Nonetheless, 18 years of calling it Xbox Live felt good, and I'm sad to see that go, and of course, I think I'll be saying Xbox Live out of reflex for some time to come, and uh, I'll be nostalgic for it. You know, I enjoyed that lettering, I enjoyed the the vibes and the, and the jokes that come with saying, you know, is live up, is live down, are you on Xbox Live, and all the mama jokes that might be through my history of Xbox Live usage. 
Nonetheless, it's an easy, easily understood move to make in some ways and puzzling in others. I'm curious what you guys think, but nothing really here beyond a name change. Where there is smoke, there is fire. And in this case, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Microsoft is deep into exclusive talks to purchase group chatting platform Discord for a reported $10 billion. And your eyes should, of course, certainly raise at this one as that acquisition amount is far larger than the $7.5 billion Bethesda purchase. Moreover, if Microsoft is acquiring Discord, what could that mean for Xbox Live? Pardon me, the Xbox Network. What could that mean for Microsoft Teams? And just what does it do to the gaming sphere? A lot of implications across a lot of different mediums here, and I'll try to do my best to to talk about my immediate reactions therein. When I think about acquisitions in Microsoft, I tend to think developers. I tend to think of studios, publishers, and IP. In this particular case, it's it's a matter of technology, and that makes me hesitant just a bit. Of course, uh, it is not too long ago that Microsoft abandoned Mixer and sort of kind of sold out its Mixer streamers, uh, despite having very impressive technology, better technology than Twitch, I might add. Of course, that was Beam that they had purchased before they rebranded it to Mixer and tried to make it something special, and that went the way of the Dodo. The same thing seemingly happened with Skype, although Skype is still used. It certainly seems to have lost much of its popularity in favor of things like Zoom and Discord, of course. And I'm very curious to see how this will play out in the gaming sphere, because many people use Discord to connect with their various gaming communities, whether it's looking for groups or podcast platforms. Of course, we've seen it used in different school settings as well. Discord can be used to talk politics, education, and any other number of devices that you just want to connect with people. I, I, I really am hesitant because, like Google, Microsoft doesn't have a track, good track record with acquiring technologies or companies like this and then supporting them. That said, we've seen a very new Microsoft under Satya Nadella, and in particular in the gaming space, Phil Spencer seems to have Satya Nadella's ear for just how to improve technologies to make gaming better. This should put you at ease then to know that Phil Spencer himself is reportedly, according to the Wall Street Journal, involved with these negotiations after Discord approached Microsoft to gauge interest. Interesting to me that Discord would be approaching Microsoft. That surprises me, and I'm very curious to know how that happens. Of course, Discord can be a free service, Discord Nitro, a paid service. However, we've had perks with Game Pass Ultimate that would lend you towards using Discord. I myself am not much of a Discord user. However, it's extremely popular with my peers in the podcasting community, and I'm pretty sure and very confident that if this deal went through, we'd see a lot of Game Pass perks and a lot of marketing for Xbox-branded properties via Discord. I'm curious to know how that would work out on a free service. I'm curious to know just how that would be used. Would those technologies be adapted? Would Microsoft Teams come into play? Would Teams or Microsoft themselves be using some of the core technology that Discord uses and it make its way into other services on Xbox Live, on Microsoft platforms, in the Microsoft suite? I'm really just wondering how much of this goes to the gaming sphere versus the overall business sphere of Microsoft. Equally curious, because these I'm just going off here, equally curious, I wonder if the, that $10 billion is pulled from, ostensibly, the same pot that you might use to purchase publishers, developers, uh, IP, or, or you know individual people and bring people into your studios. So I have a lot of questions as to just what a deal like this might bring. Of course, Clint Coombs, he was one of several that wrote in asking uh, what my thoughts were of a possible buyout of Discord, and he said that he would love to see them put the Discord app on Xbox. Well, Clint, I fully agree with you. It would be a huge win if Microsoft put the Discord app over on Xboxes. Similarly, I would like to see that Discord app make its way onto PlayStation and Switch, or whatever the Switch successor is. I think that could only benefit Microsoft, particularly if they're going to, they would have embedded perks or features for Game Pass users, or Game Pass subscribers, I should say, and they're still accessing it on their PlayStation. I think of uh, 
many of my PlayStation brethren who are Game Pass subscribers, but whenever we play a cross-play game, they prefer to play on their PlayStations. Well, what better way to keep them in the Xbox ecosystem than using Discord on a PlayStation, and that lends itself towards certain Game Pass perks. That would be a big win in terms of subscribing and keeping numbers uh, instance to to a way that's measurable and bringing business towards xbox overall not necessarily the xbox console i am cautiously optimistic about this because of that new microsoft that we've talked about the microsoft that's in play right now is simply not the same one that uh for lack of a better term shuttered mixer and beam it's not necessarily the same one that uh, did what it did to skype and we'll see where it has to go in the future. But for now, the deal is reported. It's been picked up by places like the Wall Street Journal and several others, and uh, there's a lot of potential places that this could go. I don't, again, I'm very cautious, but I don't see this as a negative at the moment, but I secretly hope that this is not the same pot of money they would use to acquire developers. I wanna see more devs come into the fold. Well, the big talking point this past week was the Friday reveal of the Twitch Gaming ID at Xbox showcase that was praised for some of the content within it, but seemingly widely disavowed for just how bad the presentation was. And that's a tough pill to swallow, particularly if you are a developer whose game was included in this showcase. Now, I should caveat this with much of what I'm saying has been picked up after the fact. I did not watch this in real time, and I want to be very clear about that. But many of my podcasting brethren did watch it in real time, many of them trying to do reaction streams, and expectations were not properly set by Twitch Gaming. ID at Xbox did do a bit of early damage control before the Twitch Gaming uh, showcase because Twitch put up an image that seemingly included the indie game Hades, with the Xbox uh, showcase suggesting that Hades would be available. That was not the case, and Xbox came out and said, hey, expectations in check, Hades is not coming. Though many people were disappointed, uh, many remain hopeful, I guess you might say, that the game will come on down the line. That said, it was the first of, I think, several missteps by Twitch and by default, I suppose, Xbox in not appropriately setting expectations for just what this show would be. Some fantastic games were showed off in this showcase, and over 25 of them, I believe, are coming to Game Pass. That said, it was a three to four hour stream that included developers being interviewed by streamers who seemingly, and I did watch a bit of these, have no experience in actual interviewing anybody, and they didn't have questions properly prepared. And it's it really fell short, and I think a lot of did a lot of those developers. A disservice when in actuality we should be celebrating all of them and I'd like to see this format rebranded just a bit so we had three and a half hours of news and updates you saw different gems like lawn mowing simulator which actually looked kind of fun uh, all things considered you had a, a, a new cooking game called soup pot some a funny game called death's door uh, the new drink box game was in there called nobody saves the world mind you drink box they made guacamelee And there were some pretty cool games showed off, and I'll talk about a few of my favorites. But before I let you know about those, I was impressed by a number that was revealed by ID at Xbox uh, boss Chris Carla. Now, Chris Carla, one of the best best people in gaming, does tremendous work uh, for Xbox indie developers and outside of them. That's a weird thing to say. What I mean to say is for indie developers that are working with Xbox in the ID at Xbox program and outside of them, I've heard many anecdotal stories from people in the industry who have talked about Chris's counsel along the way, and I'm, I'm glad to see him, again, getting some of the praise that he does deserve. But according to Carla, the indie developers in the last seven years have earned over $2 billion through the ID at Xbox program, which is, of course, Microsoft's independent developer program. Uh, that's stunning to me stunning two billion dollars in the last seven years and stating that 2,000 games have been launched through ID at Xbox since the inception seven years ago that's wonderful to hear now as thrilled as I am about two billion dollars made and 2,000 games coming through I'm curious just how those different monies are allocated how many people made money got their games uh, to be spotlighted in various elements and this is where I have a problem with Microsoft's naming conventions Very few people know what ID at Xbox 
stands for, what it means. That name does not have the recognition or panache that you would hope it would in many cases. Nintendo has the Nindies. PlayStation had a very successful campaign when it launched the PlayStation 4 called We Heart Indies. And ID at Xbox is a fantastic program, but I'm not sure many people realize what that ID stands for. In fact, to be 100% with you, I think it stands for Independent Developers at Xbox. But the fact that I don't know and I run an Xbox show and I'd have to look it up to, to you know confirm two or three times over, that worries me just a bit. I'm not sure ID at Xbox really does a good job as a, a full-fledged program at letting itself be known and more specifically, curating and spotlighting games on a regular basis with comfortable cadence. We used to have something called Summer of Arcade, and during Summer of Arcade, during those months, a different indie game was spotlighted each week, and they got all the press. We don't have anything equivalent to that now that exists in the same perpetuity and market penetration and recognition. We also have way more games, and I don't know how you solve that particular problem, but it is a problem that Microsoft needs to figure out. They've got these incredible games that come to their service, and I would argue that Microsoft does better than both PlayStation and Nintendo now at bringing indies to the platform, at supporting indies, and doing what they can to bring indie games to Xbox and allow them to be synonymous. It's the gamer perception of this that I think is failing, and that's on Microsoft, naming conventions or otherwise. Uh, I'm curious, before I go into these games, if you are aware of the ID at Xbox program and have familiarity with it, would you write in insipidghost at gmail.com or insipidghost on Twitter and let me know where you stand with your relationship with indie games on Xbox? Do you play them? Do you know about the ID at Xbox program? Does it matter to you? Uh, have you thought about that? Any of those things I am very curious about because in my mind, ID at Xbox is an incredible program that doesn't spotlight or get spotlighted in the ways that it needs to. And I, I refer to both ends of that spotlight for sure. Now on to the games that stuck out, uh, stuck out, that stood out, excuse me, to me as the best and, and things that I'm just very excited about. The first was Exomecha. Now Exomecha is set to be coming out in August of 2021, so August of this year, and the game looks really cool. Fast-paced, first-person shooter. We've seen some mechs battling in the background. I saw a lot of different movement and traversal elements, and frankly, it looks to be punching above its weight, not too far unlike Bright Memory Infinite, which of course is that game that Soul developed by, I believe, a Chinese developer, and, and Bright Infinite was that uh, precursor demo that's available for like 7 bucks on Xbox right now. Now, the problem with that is that I have been jaded by Bright Memory, which is a bad Xbox Series X game, even at $7, and Exo Mecha looks like it might be a game very similar that is visually very flashy and beautiful, but there's not much under the surface in terms of mechanics or playability. I don't know if that's the case. I'm anxious to find out if that's the case. I'm hopeful that we get another uh, showcase, as it were, where we get a bunch of demos and we can try things out. But Exomecha is on my radar, and I'm cautiously optimistic about it. Another game that I'm super stoked for, though, is one that is, of course, no stranger to this show and many others, The Ascent, which we still don't have a date for. This is, of course, that cyberpunk twin-stick shooter-esque game uh, that is just gorgeous, and everybody seems to be excited about it. No date on it yet, but the more gameplay we see, the more this game kind of reminds me of, uh, of Helldivers, if you've ever played that on PlayStation um, Vita 3 or 4. Helldivers was a twin-stick shooter that was very co-op based, but the weapons felt heavy, your player felt heavy, and you were moving around with a lot of heft and oomph to your weapons, and I'm thinking that the Ascent might be in that category as well. Regardless, Game Pass Day 1, I'm there for it whenever it is. It, the game looks beautiful. It looks like it's a, a good old time of, of shooting mayhem. And, I mean, I'm a sucker for a good twin stick, which is which is dope. Uh, let's see, what else struck my accord? A lot of people are excited about Lost Oasis, which is a new Survivor game that uh, looks cool, I guess. Not really my jam, at least not at this moment, but uh, it stood out. Another one was a 3D platformer named Omno, O-M-N-O. Omno, this looks like a 3D Journey-like game, if you remember the game Journey from PS4. Um, it's very stylized, very beautiful, a lot of, uh, I don't know, pastel is not the right word, but it, it very muted colors that are simultaneously muted and bright at the same time. Definitely go look this one up if you like 3D platformers. I'm getting Journey vibes from it, and I don't know what you guys may be getting. My instinct says if this is a 3-4 to four hour game, heck yes, sitting down day one. 8 hours, I'm in. 
12 hours or more, I'm probably out on this one. But more to see on it. Omno, O-M-N-O. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, but truly, the the highlight of the show for me was Second Extinction and getting a date on Second Extinction, which is arriving to Game Pass and Early Access, I believe, on April 28th. If you're unfamiliar with Second Extinction, this is a Left 4 Dead-style co-op first-person shooter uh, in which you are battling dinosaurs. Not zombies, not monsters, dinosaurs. And I am so excited for it. So stoked. Second Extinction and Aliens Colonial Marines are two games, co-op shooters, that I am just looking forward to and thrilled for this year. Particularly given that Back for Blood delayed a year. Which I'm glad. I'm glad Back for Blood has been pushed. Because it gives Aliens and Second Extinction room to breathe. Here's hoping they're good. Or that both of those games are good. Because I am stoked on the Aliens game. And Second Extinction is a game that I really want to support. I know it's available on PC right now, but... Uh, My PC is just not designed for that. It's a laptop, and it does what it does. Now, we had a couple different questions here, and oh my goodness, I deleted whoever it was that asked this, but uh, a brilliant question from someone who I'm so sorry I forgot your name. He or she asks, what is your favorite game in the indie showcase? Second Extinction. And a related question, what do you think makes an indie game indie? Is it the amount of developers, the budget, the size, the scope, major publisher, small publisher, no publisher? What makes a game indie? Person whose name I deleted, I'm so sorry. I think that's a fantastic question. What does make a game indie in our minds? Of course, certain games could qualify to be indie games. I mean, Cliff Plazinski could put Lawbreakers back on Xbox if he wanted to, and that would be categorized as indie. But it may not feel indie. To me, an indie game looks smaller in scope. Visuals might be downplayed just a bit. Uh, my comments on Exomecha and Bright Memory Infinite notwithstanding. And the size of the team does play a factor for me. Um, I don't have a number in mind. I don't know that there's a particular number that I say this is definitively an indie game. But I feel like less than 30. But even that feels high as I'm saying it. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's really size and scope, and it's a case-by-case basis. Now, to be blunt, Battletoads feels like an indie game to me, and it kind of is. It's a second-party game that uh, the smaller studio Dalala made for Microsoft, and by definition, first-party, but indie? I don't know. It just feels like one. Uh, Grounded is, I believe, technically an indie game, is it not? But that doesn't feel like an indie game in some ways, and in others it very much does. So there's a lot of factors there that feel intangible, that said, I'm sure the official definition is you know, a small studio under X amount of people with no major publisher involved at the time of creating and developing the game, and then they shop that game around. Uh, we'll see. I should probably take the time to, to check that one out and get back to you next week, but uh, my first reactions on that is, are, are really what I said there. All right. There was another question that came in about the showcase. This one came from Skedaddle, and he said, Xbox gained another console exclusive when Last Oasis was surprisingly shadow dropped into game preview at the recent ID at Xbox Indie Showcase. Second Extinction got a release date of April 28th. Wild at Heart got a release date of May 20th. Exomecha got confirmed for August. Also, with MechWarrior 5 Mercenaries releasing on May 27th, my question is, how likely do you think Microsoft think it is that Microsoft's Flight Simulator and Psychonauts 2 release in June and July, meaning that spring and summer has provided a new game every month for Xbox gamers to excite, get excited about? Skedaddle, that is a mouthful to read onto a podcast, but you are 100% correct. When you take a step back and look, Second Extinction, Wild at Heart, Exo Mecha, Mercenaries 5... Microsoft Flight Simulator is a possibility. Psychonauts is a possibility. In many ways, Microsoft has done a good job at bringing exclusive games to its platform. The medium you can probably include into that. Uh, That said, I don't know that they're getting the press behind it because these games just aren't the big AAA elements. It is possible that you see Psychonauts or Flight Simulator dropped in the summer, and that would be a great time to do so because we have um, the E3 equivalents that will be taking place, and Microsoft would want to generate good press for that ahead of newer announcements uh, to celebrate Xbox and say, well, da 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 this game out here, but also there. Uh, there's plenty to be excited about there. Psychonauts 2 is going to be talked about in Xbox circles on PlayStation podcasts, and that's a good thing as well. I don't know about the dates on any of those games, Skedaddle, just to be very clear and upfront. However, I love your thinking, 
And my hope is that Microsoft doubles down on messaging like that and reminds people of the good they've done for them. Microsoft has a bad habit of of not necessarily celebrating its wins and accidentally highlighting its losses. And I go back to the naming convention categories here and there. Uh, and we, we need more wins to be spotlighted with Microsoft. Uh, we always hear about Game Pass being great, but we don't necessarily always hear about the controller revolutions because they were perhaps outdone by the DualSense in some ways. But that controller is pretty darn great. There's a few other things that Microsoft could stand to celebrate a bit more, but good thoughts there, Skedaddle. I like it. There was one re- uh, one more person that wrote in about the showcase that I want to acknowledge, but offer again no answer on this one. Edward Varnell says, "What is th- or with the latest indie showcase for Xbox happening, do you see limited run games adding Xbox as as additional physical copies for some of these titles, or does Xbox still get ignored by them?" My gut instinct, Edwards, is that Limited will still continue to ignore Xbox or vice versa, but I am going to reach out to Limited Run Games and ask for the PR response for why they don't necessarily have Xbox games represented in their catalog. That is not to say that it's not Xbox's fault. We don't know. I don't have that information, but I will do my best to find it out for you. I've always been curious about that myself because I have certainly purchased a few Limited Run Games in my day, and I enjoy Limited Run Games, and I appreciate them for what they do. But it's odd they don't necessarily have Xbox in mind. That said, Microsoft's always pushed to be a very software-based company and a very digital company. Maybe there's something to that. But I'll look into it, bud. Let's take a break from this particular topic, jump into official listener mail, and then we'll get on out of here. Hi, this is Jeremy Gritton, art director and story lead for Ori and the Will of the Wisps, and you're listening to the Xbox Expansion Pass. Thank you to so many of you who wrote in about the previous topics, and we're going to get into the exclusive question segment of this this show. The first one comes from Mr. Dan O, who says, We've got to the point where we're aware Microsoft is all in on Game Pass. When do you think they'll finally flex their numbers and announce that it's profitable? Profitable. Will it be when they have reached 30, 40, 50 million subs? Will it be when exclusives sell well on Steam? My guess is by 2024. Dan, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I am sure they're going to flex their numbers as soon as they hit the 20 million mark, the 25 million mark, the 30, and so on. However, discussing and announcing their profitability might be more of a mixed bag than we may initially think. Because people are going in and out of that service and people are buying into that service at the rate of a dollar at a time, and they're getting people to bank it like myself. Rather than talk about profitability, they'll continue to to flex numbers in in the way of engagement and customers who are willing to spend money within uh, within their ecosystem. I think there is something to your logic about discussing exclusives that sell well on Steam, particularly as... Now, seemingly, their most successful exclusive is Sea of Thieves, and that you know that crossed 20 million players, and it is available on PC via Steam and the Windows Store, as well as console, and there's something to that also. Uh, I strongly feel that we will not see a profitability number so much as we'll see engagement numbers, and perhaps they share metrics for their engaged customers spending money. But if, if they were to say something like, you know, we're making... Th- Four billion profit a quarter on Game Pass, and they shuttered a studio or they canceled a game. People would would use that logic against them, and I'm not sure it would do them any favors in the long run. Good question, Dan. This next question comes from new listener Hollowfied, and he or she says, "My question is, what are your thoughts on Sleeping Dogs? In my opinion, it is hugely underrated, and I think Square should give the IP another go." Hollified, you are speaking my language. Sleeping Dogs is one of the best games, top five games, during the Xbox 360 PS3 generation. And I strongly recommend that any and everyone go out and get that game. It's always on sale on PS4 and Xbox One. It is back and pat if you're a Series S or X user. You absolutely must check out Sleeping Dogs. It is a fantastic game. 
Arkham style combat, Grand Theft Auto style world, all taking place in Tokyo while you're a detective that plays on both sides of the law. I love Sleeping Dogs. I platinumed it on PlayStation. I believe I 1 would it on 360. And I thought that I had 1 would it on Xbox One. But thanks to this question, Holified, I re-downloaded it and realized I had not actually played the Xbox One version of the game. I'd played it on all these other platforms, PS3, PS4, Xbox 360. But now I have another way to play it and get credit for it. And I'm so excited for it. As for Square doing what they need to do to get that IP another go, yes. There was once an online MMO that was going to be within that universe, and that went the way of the Dodo as well. They absolutely should rectify Sleeping Dogs, particularly as Tomb Raider has waned in popularity. And I'm loving the Tomb Raider games. I actually bought that collection while it was like 10 bucks or whatever it was for all three games. I'm playing through the first one right now. Tomb Raider, of course, fantastic franchise. Laura Croft and Fortnite. But uh, Square needs new franchises or franchises that it can capitalize on while they give Tomb Raider a break. And Sleeping Dogs is a perfect, perfect option to consider. And uh, here's hoping they do it, but I just don't think they will. I just don't think they will. It's a shame. The next question comes from my buddy Aman, and he asks if Microsoft should revamp their achievement system or update it in any way. To answer this question, Aman, yes, I do think it is time to update the achievement system. It has been some time since they've really done that. Of course, they added the rare achievement uh, option in, to games in, in the last few years. However, it does need an update, and I would love a way where Microsoft re-awards achievements for games that you've replayed after X amount of years or something like that. I have played Arkham, the all the Arkham games on PS4, PS3, Xbox 360, and Xbox One. And I have no way to earn more achievements in that game by just replaying it. So there is less incentive for achievement hunters to keep playing those particular games. I would love to find a way to get achievements in Arkham Knight again. I would, I would pay for Five bucks if I could redo that uh, to replay a game and get more gamer score and credit for doing so. Uh, other things that they need to do are perhaps offering in-game rewards for achievements. They used to do this with the avatars. Uh, or I should say in-ecosystem rewards for earning achievements or ways to show off your achievements that they no longer have. They're not as spotlighted as we've been able to customize a lot of our display options. Uh, but I would like to see them find a way to use achievements outside of strictly gamer score. That ship sailed in some cases, not in others. And if any of you have a good idea for how to improve achievements, I welcome it. The last question is one that I'm going to extend to the audience as well. This one comes from my good friend Todd Oxtra, who recently had me on his show, Super Friends Unite, to talk about the Snyder Cut, which was a joy for me, Todd. He says... If Rocksteady won't make a JLA game, who should? And man, oh man, do I have no idea what studio I want, and I want all the studios to do it, because I want Rocksteady to ditch that Suicide Squad mess and make for me a single or co-op-based JLA game. And when I say co-op-based, I don't mean, I do not mean like Avengers, I do not mean like Destiny, I mean something like Outriders, where I can just play through uh, different missions, single player, not worry about grinding anything. I could if I wanted to, but I do not want to, just to be very clear. I just want to be the Flash. I want to be Green Lantern. I want to be Superman. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Uh, finding a way to get those heroes together and playable, I don't know. You might run into the Avengers problem, and I don't know that there are many studios that are qualified to do it. For goodness sake, Square Enix botched it bad. I, I think top of that list is always going to be Rocksteady. Insomniac would be up there, though, of course, I don't, I don't want a JLA game to be exclusive to anybody. I'm not a fan of that. Um, there's, there are just so many. I mean, oh, gosh. I don't have a good I, a one single answer. I, will, I just want the game, Todd. I just want the game. Man, I'm so devastated that, uh, that Gotham Knights has been delayed till next year. I'm devastated not to have a DC Comics game this year. Uh, I don't know where Injustice 3 is, but after the Snyder Cut and the goodwill around these incredible CW shows, some of them are bad, but some of them are really good, I just want this DC comic celebration that's happening in my mind and my life to extend it into my gaming verse. So, I don't know. If you guys have a better option, uh, audience, I would love to hear it. 
Well, that's going to do it for this episode of XEP. Thank you guys so much for listening and following on all your podcast services. Of course, you can subscribe over on YouTube at youtube.com slash Xbox Expansion Pass. You can follow me on Twitter at InsipidGhost, and you can always email me or the show insipidghost at gmail.com. Take care.